When we're building a custom car audio system, one of the most important pieces of gear that we can add that will add to the performance of the system is a digital signal processor, or a DSP for short. This allows us to take a source signal from a stock or aftermarket head unit or other device, process that signal to optimize our sound performance, and output that changed signal to our aftermarket amplifiers. Now, if you've never used a DSP before, the learning curve can be pretty steep, especially if you are fairly new to car audio. So that's why we're making this video right here to better understand some of the more complex terminology that is used throughout the process of integrating a DSP. Watching this video is going to better prepare you for some of the more complex videos that I'm gonna show you guys at the end of this one. Now, a quick disclaimer, some of the terms that we're gonna talk about are very basic and pretty self-explanatory, but I don't wanna leave anything out just in case you are very fresh to car audio. And you know what, now that I'm thinking about it, I think it might be better to hop on over to the computer because a lot of the different terms that we're gonna talk about exist in the software, which is how we connect to the DSP using the computer to control this device. All right guys, here I am down in the corner here, and we're gonna be looking at the audio control DSP software. Now a quick side note, regardless of what brand of DSP you are using, the software is going to have many of the same terms. So even though in this case we're looking at audio control software, much of what you're gonna learn here applies to all of the other different brands. So first off, input channels and output channels. Input channels is going to be our signal coming into the device. In other words, our speaker wires connected from our factory car audio system providing signal directly to the DSP, or it could be even a signal coming from an aftermarket head unit as an input into the DSP. It's important to understand the difference between our inputs and our outputs because we're going to be doing all sorts of different things to each of these signals and then outputting them out of the DSP. Understanding inputs and outputs is important when it comes to our next term, which is signal summing. Let's change up something in the software really quick and let's say that this is just a front set of component speakers being ran off of what's called a passive crossover. In other words, we have only two channels that are providing signal for a left and right speaker, but there are four total speakers. There's two tweeters and two mid-range speakers being driven from that passive crossover. In that case, let's say that we want our signal to be coming in, but we're using a tweeter signal on channels one and two, and then a mid-range signal on channels three and four. We might wanna do what's called signal summing, where we add the signal coming from the tweeter to the signal coming from the mid-range. That way we have more frequencies of information to send to our outputs of our front component speaker set. Now the next term you wanna know, the next common thing you're gonna see in DSP software is memory or different presets. Basically in a DSP, when we're doing our system tune and we're adjusting all of these different settings, we could have each of those different sets of settings be different for different presets or different memories. The reason this is valuable is let's say that we wanna have a one seat tune. In other words, a tune that is optimized just for the listening position. Well, I could do all of that tuning and set that up all to be under preset number one. But let's say when we're going to have a passenger in the vehicle that we want the tune to sound good for them as well. In that case, we could have a totally separate, different tune set up for a preset or memory number two. Another example of a preset that you might wanna set up, let's say preset three in this case, is one where we drastically reduce the bass performance of our system. Why would we wanna do that? Well, let's say that we're taking in our car to the dealer and we don't want somebody just ripping on our subwoofer system. We could massively negate that bass performance. We could even unplug the controllers so that the preset can't be changed and hey, now we're good to go. Now the next term we need to know, and this is something that you need to know regardless of if you are setting up a car audio system, is input gain or sensitivity. This is very similar to that connection that you see on your amplifier when you are tuning it. We're going to wanna set up this input gain so that we don't ever reach a clipping point when we are at our max system volume. We don't wanna be creating clipping or any sort of distortion coming out of our DSP. And once we have that input signal set up, a similar setting is our level setting for each of our different output channels. As an example, let's say that we're tuning our system and we're finding that our tweeter outputs, let's say on this case on channels one and two, are just far too loud in comparison to our mid-range and mid-bass. What we could do is we could actually attenuate that level 
Let's say that we want it to be negative 6 dB in comparison to the rest of the speakers. So the rest of our speakers are going to be just fine. And let's say that our mid-range is even a little bit too loud, but not quite as loud as the treaters. Let's do that at negative 3 dB. These are all adjustments that can be performed. And in the audio control software, we can also click the number one here. You can see this gives us the opportunity to now control different sides. The reason it might be valuable to control one side of the speakers versus the other is let's say that our tweeter position on the left side on channel one is much, much closer to our listening position than the other side. In that case, again, we might want to attenuate the volume so that our imaging is better. Now, the next term is one of those terms that is very self-explanatory, but I want to mention how it's used in the DSP software, and that is mute. Obviously, when we mute something, we remove that volume, and the reason this is valuable is when we're tuning a system, a lot of times we want to isolate a certain speaker that we are measuring with an acoustic microphone in the vehicle. So in this case, let's say that I'm focusing on doing all of my EQ and all of my controls for speaker number one, which is a tweeter, we're gonna unmute that and you saw that I went through and I have the rest of the system completely muted. That way we can focus just on the performance of that one particular speaker and adjust it as needed. And again, this is something that exists in virtually every DSP software. It's just done a little bit differently in each software. So you need to research on your application and determine how to do it. Now is also a good time to mention what the term mono means. So a stereo signal is when you have left and right information and when somebody is recording a music track let's say they want to have the bass drum appear to be coming from the right side of your soundstage you're going to hear it more from the right side of the system this is when it's important to have a stereo signal but there are cases in something like a subwoofer amplifier where you may want the left and the right signal combined together into a mono signal and we can do that with a mono button in the DSP software now our signal setting and our level setting and crossovers and delay which we're going to talk about in a second, those are all things that we generally want to be setting first before we do any sort of equalization. So I just wanted to mention that, but we're going to talk about that stuff in a second here because I want to explain EQ next. So here in this section, they have it labeled as RTA, which stands for a real-time analyzer. And something very important that I want to explain to you guys is there's two different types of RTA that you're going to commonly see in car audio. There's using an electrical signal RTA, and then there's using an acoustic signal RTA. In other words, a signal that comes from measuring a microphone of the actual acoustic performance. Here on the computer right now, I'm not currently actually connected to a device. There's no hardware connected, so I can't show you this. So I'm going to show you some B-roll video, some separate video I did in the past instead. But it's important to understand that the signal that you're seeing on screen right now, that is the incoming electrical signal. This is extremely important to understand because a lot of people get confused and they think, okay, I want a perfectly flat electrical signal, but that is not the case. What you want is you want your acoustic signal to match a target curve. More on target curves in just a second. So what that means is when we're actually measuring with an RTA microphone, when we have a microphone sitting in the listening position of our vehicle and we're measuring with an RTA, we're gonna see an acoustic response curve and we're going to want to correct that using what's called an equalizer in order to match the performance that we're trying to get. Now really quick, a shout out to our show sponsor, Audio Control. I do wanna mention something that is somewhat unique to the audio control brand of processors. What they do is they have this input view here. And what's nice about that, again, I'm showing you B-roll on screen, is you can see the incoming electrical signal. The reason seeing that incoming electrical signal is valuable is when it comes to doing our signal summing on our outputs. There's oftentimes situations where you're tapping into a factory speaker level signal and that signal might be limited to, let's say as an example, only the high range of information. It's valuable to be able to see that on the electrical input signal RTA. And the reason that's valuable is it tells us that if we wanted to have a full range signal coming out, again, let's say that this is full range speakers on channels one and two, by being able to see what's in each electrical signal, it would allow us to determine what channels we should add together on that signal summing that we referenced earlier. So again, valuable to understand the difference between electrical and acoustic signal. And if you guys wanna learn more about the audio control lineup of processors, learn more down in the video description. 
Now, while we're talking about equalizers, it's important to understand that there are different types of equalizers. This is a 30 band graphic EQ, which means we can adjust 30 different points of information here, but each of these frequencies is locked at where it is. So I can only boost this frequency or cut it. I can't actually adjust the frequency that I'm adjusting to the left or the right. This is a similar case for a 14 band EQ. In this case, you just have less adjustment than the 30 band EQ, but where you do get more EQ and what I would actually encourage most people out there to use is a parametric equalizer. With a parametric equalizer, we can adjust the frequency point that we are adjusting up and down. You can see how I can adjust this to the left and the right and I can target a much more specific frequency. The other thing that's valuable here is I can control the Q value. And the Q value is basically the range of information that's impacted close to this particular frequency. So in this case, we have 52.8 Hertz. And if I go with a really high Q, that means that I'm only going to be impacting frequencies that are very close to this value when I boost or cut it. If I go to a much lower Q value, you can see that that curve starts to get wider. Let's go super, super low there. And now you can see I'm impacting a huge range of frequencies as I boost or cut. The reason that this parametric equalizer is far more powerful and, in my opinion, better to use is when we are looking at the acoustic performance and measuring with a microphone, it's far more common that you're going to see a range of information that needs to be addressed rather than just one certain frequency. And in this case, even though there's only 10 different points that we can adjust parametrically, because we have that Q value that we can change, it does give us a lot of control. Now earlier I mentioned a target curve and it's kind of not really something you want to look at in this case here. This is, you know, our electrical performance that we're adjusting when we adjust this EQ. But when we are looking at matching a target curve, we'd want to do that in the acoustic domain. And the reason that a target curve is a valuable term to know is when we're tuning a car audio system, we oftentimes won't actually like the way it sounds if it's completely flat. You can tune the acoustic domain of a car audio system to be completely flat, but a lot of times it just seems like it's lacking. It doesn't have as much bass as you would like, and the highs and other frequencies might seem too loud or too quiet. For that reason, it's valuable to tune to what's called a house curve or a target curve. In this case here, this is Audio Control's house curve that they've came up with. That means basically in their opinion, they like to see a nice increase in output up to about you know 70 hertz or so, and then they like to see it kind of roll off all the way up to 1K and then kind of come back up and then another roll off as you get into those high range frequencies. The biggest thing I wanna stress here is there is no one right answer when it comes to a target curve. What I recommend you do when you are using a microphone and you're tuning the acoustic performance of your car audio system using a DSP, I recommend that you find a house curve that works best for you. That might be somebody like Audio Control. Maybe you love the way that their house curve sounds, or maybe you tune to that and then you find you like even a little bit more bass. So then now you have your own target curve that you should use in the future. At the end of the day, the biggest point to take away from this is it's not necessarily always best to just tune to a flat system performance. Now back to crossovers, these are something that you want to initially set because it's going to help you protect your speakers. What a crossover does is it basically limits the frequencies of information that are sent to a speaker. So if you think of something like a tweeter, you don't want a ton of bass going to a tweeter, it could instantly make it blow. So we're going to adjust our crossovers so we're only allowing above a certain frequency to actually get past our DSP and go to the tweeter. In comparison, let's look at a subwoofer. Obviously we don't want our subwoofer playing tweeter frequencies. So we want to adjust this down lower. Let's say we want to set it at 80 Hertz and let's say we want to set our high pass crossover to bypass. That means there is no high pass crossover. This is going to allow everything 80 Hertz and below to be sent to the subwoofer. Now, a big thing I want to point out here because it's definitely led to some confusion in the past is a crossover isn't a hard cutoff point. In other words, if I have my low pass crossover set at 80 Hertz, that doesn't mean that if I play an 81 Hertz test tone, I'm not gonna hear it. You're gonna hear it at a slightly, slightly reduced volume, 
but you're still going to hear frequencies above that. And how many frequencies you hear above that is controlled by the crossover slope. If we were to use a 24 dB per octave slope, that means that it's going to have a much more harsh cutoff point than if we were to use a 12 dB per octave slope. Again, we are focused more on the terminology here. So if you guys wanna get a little bit more advanced and learn things like how do you pick a crossover point? What frequency should you use? What slope should you use? If you guys wanna learn more about the crossover topic in detail, I have a full video here on the channel. Now the next terminology that's important to know is time delay or time alignment. In the grand scheme of things, a sound wave actually travels relatively slow. So when we're sitting in the listening position of a vehicle, let's say that our front left tweeter is 20 inches away from our listening position and our front right tweeter is, let's say, 52 inches away from our listening position. We want to tell the DSP that information because what the DSP can now do is it's going to calculate and determine this on its own, but it's going to delay the signal that's being sent to that front left speaker. It's going to delay it so that it doesn't emit that signal for a certain amount of time so that that way the signals coming from the front left and front right arrive at our listening position at the exact same time. Now, when I've talked about time delay in the past, people have brought up, oh, you know, that's only like what? Let's see, that's like a, uh, a 32 inch difference. And hey, the speed of sound is like 343 meters per second. That's so much faster. And that 32 inch difference, that's never going to matter. But it is in fact going to matter because we do want our speakers to be in phase as much as possible at our listening position. The scope of this video isn't really to get too far into detail in that. And if you do want to learn more, definitely check out some of my full DSP tuning videos so that you can better understand. But the biggest point I want to make here is time delay really does have a significant impact on the performance of your system. Now, speaking of phase, something a little bit more advanced that I want to enable really quick just to mention is the use of an all pass filter. An all pass filter is pretty unique because what it does is Unlike a crossover filter, it doesn't actually limit any of the bandwidth of frequency information being sent to a speaker, but what it does do is it impacts the phase of a speaker. So much like a crossover, we can pick a frequency for our all pass filter to be applied, and we can also control things like the slope and the Q value, but again, the all pass filter doesn't actually limit any of the frequency response information. Again, it's changing the phase, which allows us to control the way some of the different speakers interact with each other at our listening position. Using all pass filters is more of an advanced topic, but it's something that's really cool and can come in handy for creating a car that sounds amazing in both front listening positions. I'd love to cover it in more detail. If you guys would like to see a more detailed video about it, be sure to let me know. So a few more terms here that are helpful to know. Oftentimes with a DSP, we're going to have a remote control that connects to the DSP. And the advantage of having that is we can turn up the volume level remotely for our system. So sometimes you might have a system where you want that volume to be a master system volume. And in that case, we'd want to enable our level control with the remote volume here on all of the channels. That allows me to turn up the whole system all at once. But there are other uses for that level control. Let's say that we want to keep our normal master system volume on the radio as our total system volume, but we want to adjust the subwoofer volume independently. What we would do in that case is we're going to disable the level control on all of these output channels, but we're just going to leave it enabled for our subwoofer outputs. By doing that, boom, now we have a volume control for just those output channels of the subwoofer. Finally, this is something that's unique to audio control because they do have a patent on this particular item. This is the AccuBase technology. A lot of times with a factory car audio system, as you turn up that volume, what the factory radio or factory amplifier will do is it will stop increasing the volume level of the bass. And the car manufacturers do that to protect their inexpensive stock speakers. So with the AccuBase technology, built into this, what you can do is you can allow the device to determine that point at which the volume starts reducing on the bass and bring it back in, essentially restoring it as you turn up the volume. 
Again, that's something that's specific just to the audio control brand of processors, but I wanted to mention it since you do see it there on screen. So I think that covers the vast majority of the terms that you need to know, but if I did miss something, be sure to let me know in a comment. And if you're part of the community and you see somebody that needs some help, jump on in and let them know. I have quite a few videos here on the channel that go in depth into the process of tuning with a DSP. If you wanna check those out, check out that playlist here on screen. Don't forget, if you are implementing a DSP into your system, definitely check out the audio control DM series of processors and their D series of amplifiers that have the DSP technology built in. A special thanks to Audio Control for being a sponsor of the channel and thank you to Jerry William and the rest of the Patreon membership team for making these videos possible and I'll see you guys in the next one.